Thank you, everyone. And let me again express appreciation for Adventist Today. Uh, this Adventist Today Sabbath School is, is a miracle. And uh, uh, miracles are everyday occurrences uh, that we take for granted. But I do not take this for granted. And I don't think we, any of us should take this for granted. And we see how the Holy Spirit works in just the everyday affairs of our lives. So thank you. Lauren and all the team of Adventist today that have made this um, Sabbath school possible. Now I'm discussing headship theology and how headship theology perverts the gospel. Now uh, this is really uh, something that <laughs> I could flesh out you know in an entire book and I could go into discussing what headship theology is but that will take up a lot of time. So we're going to make some assumptions about headship theology and perhaps in the discussion, we can talk about what that is. But um, the headship theology tends to develop out of, to me, a last resort to keep women out of the highest office, highest clerical offices, not just keep them out, but affirm them as, uh, as part of uh, the highest clerical offices that we have, because we still have women preaching, teaching, taking on pastoral work, which traditionally would not have been even allowed based on certain interpretations of the scripture, which says women should be silent and, and so forth. And so headship theology is like a last resort, which says the man is the head, as Christ is the head, so is the man, and therefore the man must be head not only of the family, but also of the church. And so we maintain that headship idea. And I'm saying it's a perversion of the gospel. It does not reflect at all in the way the early church uh, preached and practiced the gospel. Um, I haven't started sharing, so I think I have to begin to share my screen. So, okay, let's share a screen. First of all, um, before I share screen, let me just do one thing here. Um, okay, I think I'm lost. <laughs> just a minute. I need to do this. Then I need to share my screen. Just give me one minute here. Let me share my screen first. Um, Okay, now, okay, all right. So, just one minute. All right, so I wanna start, and I'm gonna start and end with this text in Galatians chapter one, verse six, verses six to seven. I am astonished that so quickly you have you are you are deserting. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that they are, not that there's another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what is the gospel? So we're gonna look at what is the gospel according to the teaching of the early church and according to the prophetic oracles. And many people assume that the gospel is a Christian phenomenon. No, the gospel is a Hebrew prophetic phenomenon. That's what the gospel is. And we can see that um, explained in Isaiah 61, where Isaiah speaks of his anointing. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news. Now that term uh, we translate good news is the same term we translate gospel. Euangelion in the Greek, in the Septuagint, euangelion, it means gospel. Same word you translate gospel, other translators say gospel. So he has sent me to bring the gospel to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And here we see Jesus, uh, according to Luke, gets up and reads from Isaiah as his mission statement. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I was sent to do. 
the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And here there's a slight difference here because um, in the New Testament authors are using the Septuagint, the Greek version um, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, so you see a, a slight difference here. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he's in the synagogue and they began to look at him. Now, what's this about? And he says, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So here Jesus declares that he's now come as the anointed one to preach the gospel. In other words, to take up from where the Hebrew prophets left off and where somehow his religion had forgotten and neglected the gospel of the prophets that was preached by, was preached by the prophets. Um, okay. Now let us look at two essential elements of the gospel that we will get from this text. It says the Lord has anointed me. He has anointed me. That word anointed comes from the same word we translate Messiah, right? And then liberation. Another element is liberation. Said so to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor is actually the time of liberation in ancient Israel. It refers to Jubilee. So let us look at these a little more closely. So the gospel and Messiah. Now the word uh, we translate Messiah is English sized form of the Hebrew Mashiach. Um, and of course, it's uh, the Greek equivalent is Christos, which is anglicized as Christ. So the, the words Messiah and the words Christ, they, they are the same words, just different language. One is from the Hebrew equivalent and one from the Greek. All right, just like uh, Pedro and Pierre and, and Peter, you know, they're all the same um, name, term. Um, so the term literally means anointed one. The king of his ancient Israel was a Mashiach because he was anointed to reign over Israel in justice, justice according to the covenant. So in Hebrew prophecy, Mashiach is no ordinary anointing. It is an, an anointing towards radical liberation. And that is why this messianic uh, oracle in Isaiah, it says um, he, he has, uh, and if you notice, in fact, if you go back in the Isaiah text, this is not, Isaiah didn't end here. Um, it, it, Isaiah text continues to describe what the gospel is about, but Jesus ends with this part where he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And, um, and you see why Jesus ends there, uh, because the Mashiach, Mashiach is, is the anointing is an anointing towards radical liberation. So let's talk about the liberation aspect. Now here it ends with to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That refers to Jubilee, the year of Jubilee. And Jubilee is the 50th year. It's like the ultimate Sabbath in ancient Israel, the seven times 70 year. And in Leviticus 25 describes Jubilee, what happens in Jubilee. But there's this central aspect of Levit Leviticus 25, verse 10, he says, you shall hallow the 50th year and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land. And if we know about Jubilee, Jubilee is a time when all the sabbatical year um, rules are again come into effect and added to that foreclosed property return and so forth. So it shall be a Jubilee for you. You shall return everyone to your own property and everyone to your own family. It was a time of real um, socioeconomic liberation in ancient Israel. So the gospel is about an anointing towards liberation. That's what it is. So let's look at the idea of Messiah and liberation together. So in biblical prophetic narrative, Messiah is agent of liberation, as I've noted before. Kings of Israel are messianic agents of the Abrahamic covenant to reign over Israel in justice. So the essence of messianic hope in Hebrew prophetic tradition is a quest for justice, hope that God's reign of justice will finally come upon the earth. And so when we read, for example, Jeremiah 23, 5, we need to read it in this context. It says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David, a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And all these prophetic messianic, what we may call prophecies, um, of course, when we point them to Christ, it's really secondary. In the primary sense, they were actually 
referring to the very hope of Israel in their time uh, uh, for uh, the reign of God's righteousness and, and the proper mediation of the covenant, um, which, which, for, uh, which chronically was not appropriately mediated in ancient Israel because of the injustice and corruption um, against which the prophets constantly preached and cried out against. And of course, they ended up stoning the prophets rather than listening to them. Now let's look at Jesus, Jesus Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth receives this anointing and, and authority at the river Jordan at his baptism. And according to Luke, he passes it on to the church who is to call the world into this experience of liberation. And of course in Acts, you know, the, the Holy Spirit came down upon the church and they again were anointed, all right? So it, the messianic uh, call is now to the church. And so the gospel that we are preaching is supposed to be the gospel about God's liberation. What is that liberation meant in the early church? And I've just used the term in Christ here because that is the call to be in Christ, meaning we talk about Christ, the word Christ here, term Christ. Again, Christ is not a name, all right? It's an anointing. Uh, so let's just look a little more closely on that in Messiah. So the early church invokes this prophetic interpretation of Messiah as agent of liberation. And we see, we can say Paul, the, the writings of Paul, especially what we call the seven uh, authentic letters of Paul, they reflect so clearly the theology, the missiology, uh, soteriology of the early church, including the gospels as well. So this is a, a main uh, text in uh, Galatians 5.1, I forgot to put in the text there where Paul is discussing uh, uh, the whole question of circumcision, which was about the um, Jewish Jesus followers uh, imposing Judaism upon the Gentiles. Because remember the early church was a Judaic movement. They weren't called, they, it wasn't another religion. It was a movement religion within Judaism. So one of the conclusive statements Paul made to address this issue is he says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What is that yoke of slavery he's talking about? Maybe we'll get that as we move in this discussion. So Paul articulates the whole concept of Messiah as a spiritual state of being, as an anointing of the spirit. So to the call to be in Christ is not a call into a religion or a, or, or a set of doctrines or beliefs, but it's a call into a new way of life, into a spiritual way of life, which he saw as lacking um, in, 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 in the traditional religiosity of his own community. So that's why he asked in the Galatian controversy, um, are you so foolish having started with the spirit? Are you ending with the flesh? What is this flesh he's talking about? Now, if we summarize it, this flesh is, is, is patriarchal driven religious ethnic domination. Why? Now, again, a lot of people like to go into Galatians and Romans and they talk about the whole concept of righteousness by faith as this individualistic quest for personal piety that is far from what Paul was talking about. Paul was addressing a community that was ethnocentric, a community that believed that only uh, 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 the circumcised male can accept the Abrahamic covenant, the circumcised male. Now, the circumcised male is a Jewish male here. Now, anybody can, any male can access the Abrahamic covenant, but you have to be circumcised, meaning you have to become a Jew. Of course, women are uh, access is only indirectly because they had no agency. So Paul called for the circumcision um, of the heart. So here Paul saw it as circumcision of the flesh. You're all about flesh. You're all, all about Jewishness and maleness. And so he called for a circumcision of the heart. So that's what he was talking about when he talks about works of the flesh. It was not a question about personal piety and how we stand before God. That was not the discussion of Paul in Galatians or even Romans. It was about a discussion as to whether your religious ethnic uh, affiliation is what will give you access to the promise of Abraham. That is the dis dis discussion there. Um, so what is the other gospel then? 
The other gospel that he refers to is actually the work of flesh. And in Paul's conversation, it's the same as works of law. All right. And so, as I say, the Reformation and Luther misapplies this and calls it Judaic legalism. Jews were not legalists. They were nomis. What, what um, uh, um, uh, E.P. Sanders, uh, and that's a whole lot of stuff, but some of the theologians here might know what I'm talking about, refers to as covenantal nomism. They believe they were people of the covenant. They were chosen, not because they, they were um, entitled, but because God simply chose them. Um, they were never entitled to the Abrahamic uh, promise. Uh, the entitled one was Ishmael. And if, even if it went to is Isaac, the entitled one was Esau, and so forth. So, so they were not entitled. They believe God called them because God simply chose them. So they weren't legalists. What they were covenantal nomies, they believe that if you want to access the covenant, you need to come into this covenant community. You need to come into covenant through the act of circumcision. That was what Paul was arguing against. He says no. And so what occurred, what was what works of flesh Paul is referring to is this egotistic or e egoistic boundary inducing identities of ethnicity, religion, gender, class. Because if you're female, you won't have access to the covenant either You because you're not circumcised. And if you're slaves, you know, you're usually not, you're usually, many slaves were, were also gender non-conforming. Many slaves were, were neutered and so forth. So works of law is specifically a term used to repudiate the cult of Jewish maleness signified by circumcision. You say only Jewish males had direct access to the covenant. That was the point that he was addressing. So we continue to look at in Messiah. So, so one of the conclusive statements Paul makes in Galatians chapter two, he says, it is, I, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this is about the messianic identity, which is a spiritual identity over against the Judaic identity, which is a fleshy identity. We, 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 so, so that's why he says now there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer free, slave or free. There's no longer male and female. For these are all fleshly identities. We are all one in Messiah, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heir according to the promise. All right, so the heir, to be heir to the Abrahamic covenant is not about a fleshly identity. It's about a spiritual identity, the identity that comes when we are in Christ. So as we said, um, uh, so we say that any sustainable egalitarian reading of Paul must understand that the call to liberation and equality is a call beyond historical, egoistic self-identity towards an understanding of the true spiritual nature of humanity that transcends these historical identities. You know, my religion, my ethnicity, my class, my race, these are all historic identities or historical identities. So any true egalitarianism requires the dissolution of the ego. This is the fundamental project of Pauline didactics. This is a fundamental project of the teachings of Paul. In Galatians, the ego is flesh, a works of law that Messiah overcomes. So that's why he said, for through law, I die to law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I will live, but Christ who lives within me. Again, this idea of law is not about 10 commandments or this blah, blah, blah. The idea of law is what represents Jewish religious ethnicity. That's what it is representing there. There are other places where Paul talks about law in different ways, because Paul doesn't use the term law uh, to mean the same thing all the time. You just have to look at the context in which he uses it. In Galatians, this is what he's talking about. So the ego of Jewish maleness marks of boundaries that messianic liberation confronts and dissolves in Christ. All have agency, both the circumcised and the uncircumcised. That is the Jew, the Gentile, the females, and all others who do not conform to Jewish maleness. This is the Pentecost experience, which a prophetic messianic proclamation of Joel describes after those days, I will pour my spirit on all flesh, your sons, your daughters, your old men, your young men. 
even on the uh, male slaves, it says even on the male and female slaves, I will pour out my spirit. So we see here where it, 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 where Paul's idea that neither slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, here we see it's capturing this um, messianic prophecy um, by Joel. So in Messiah is the call to a new way of life. It is not a call to a religion. The early church were not, was not calling people to a religion. And I, I, it is very misleading when we refer to the early church as Christianity because the religion did not exist then. If it, there's, the term Christian was just a name and a label. Um, they were all Jews. They were all members of the synagogue till separation had to take place because of the radical nature of their teachings. And it's risky, <laughs> um, uh, the risk of their teachings. So it was not a call to a religion or a belief system or a set of rituals. In Messiah finds expression in two ways, two other ways. And, and it's important that I bring this in because we're going to meet them. In spirit, all right, and kurio. You know, we see that verse Corinthians 11, 11. In Lord, there's therefore no, you know, man is not independent of woman. It's the same call to be in Christ. And here, if you notice, it's in spirit, not in the spirit or in kurio, in the in Lord, not in the Lord. There's no definite article here. In Greek, the absence of the definite article um, from these terms uh, in, in Greek syntax uh, um, uh, um, indicates that they encompass and exceed personal identity towards a way of being that transcends this fleshy, egoistic identities of gender, ethnicity, and race. So it's about a way of being, huh? not in the Lord, in the spirit, or in, in the Christ, but it is a way of life and existence, uh, uh, and so, so to speak. So in, in Christo, in Messiah, the body of, of Christ, the spiritual body overcomes the limitations imposed by the fleshly existence. This is what Paul was advocating against. So let us look a little now what in Christ means. Um, as far as the radical egalitarianism, we see there in 1 Corinthians 11, 3 to 12. So let, now let us look at the two major texts of headship, <laughs> that are, uh, um, two major texts that have been interpreted to reinforce um, male or headship. So this is the statement I'll make right up front here. Um, thus far, what we observe in the theology, Christology, and soteriology of Paul indicates that the patriarchal assumptions that lie behind these so-called texts of male headship and female submission and silence derive not from Paul's consciousness, which itself had transformed into a Christ consciousness. What we are confronting in, in these patriarchal Pauline texts appears to be hostile takeover of Paul's voice, whether through interpretation, impersonation, or interpolation. So let us see how much we can look at that. Um, I, think, I, I think my time, is, is my time up already? <laughs> uh, I tell you friends, it's gonna take uh, just a little more time. You um, take your time. Go you ahead. Have plenty of, you have plenty of time, doctor. Oh, okay. You just take your time. We're really enjoying this. We want to hear the whole presentation. Okay. Um, my slide is, okay, there we go. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 12. We can look at it quickly. Uh, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the husband is the head of the wife. God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head, this grace is his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled, this grace is her head. It is, it is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. But for if a woman will not veil her herself, then she should cut off her hair. But it's a disgraceful for a woman to have her hair um, cut off or be shaved. She, um, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled since he's the image and reflection of God. But woman is the reflection of man. <laughs> Indeed, man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but for the sake of man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority in her head because of the angels. Then he says, nevertheless, in the Lord, 
In Messiah, another way of saying it, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes from woman, but all things come from God. So let's look at the two opposing arguments. See, what we see here in 1 Corinthians 11, 12 are two opposing arguments. We see a headship argument where it says Christ is the head of every man and the husband is the head of the wife and God is the head of Christ. And then we see a repudiation of the headship argument in the Lord. Remember we're saying Kurio, same as in Christo. Woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman. But all things come from God. Let's look at it a little closer. Let's look at what head covering was in the ancient world. Obviously, women were not covering their heads. Otherwise, the vigilantes would not have reason to write to Paul and say there are some women here not covering their heads. Because head covering in that ancient world was a sign of male authority. Okay? Women had no agency. It's a sign of male headship. Either that they were, were under the headship of their fathers or the headship of their husbands. And my friends, believe it or not, even the headship of their pimps. All right, they didn't like women who had their own business back then. They didn't wear head covering. So even today, pimps don't like women who have their own business. So um, it was a sign of the fact that a woman had no, no agency. Um, now the question is then, why would women in the church go, go with their heads uncovered? Obviously they were not covering their heads. It simply means that as far as they understood the gospel, they were now free moral agents. They didn't need to be under the authority of a male. That is what was going on in the church. They were asserting their own agency in Christ. That was what was happening. And there were vigilantes who said, no way. This is not happening in the church. They write to Paul. Then Paul now <laughs> seems to present an argument that, that uh, sustains it or that justifies it. And then he throws out the argument. Why does he throw out the argument? Because the first argument is not in Christ. It's an argument of the flesh. The second argument is the spiritual argument. Um, let us look at it a little closer. So we also notice a questionable argument in the text. It says a man ought not to have his head veiled since he's the image and reflection of God. But a woman is a reflection of man. Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. But what does John Genesis 1.26 says? God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. God let them, them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing of the earth. Um, where did I have God? Oh, I think I, I didn't add the other text to things. It's, it's, it's Genesis 1 28. I should have here. Genesis 1 28, um, says, um, 1 28 says God. Oh yes. 27. God created humankind. I left the 27 in his image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This text seems to be an interpretation of the second account of creation in Genesis, an interpretation of it, mind you, which was a popular interpretation that had infiltrated Judaism um, where they, they fixated on the second account of creation as far as gender relations, that woman was made from man for man, um, a woman sinned and all that being the justification for male domination. Um, but is headship argument Paul's argument? I'm saying it is not. The text suggests it is not. And if we understand Greek rhetorical style, Paul was a learned Greek rhetorician. And what Greek rhetoric does is that is lays out the opponent's argument, which we find in verses three to 10, and then it presents um, the just position. In, in verses 11 to 12. And if anybody has ever um, written the works of Plato, where you see um, Socrates arguing, arguing with his interlocutors, you will see that he uses just the same uh, uh, methodology. He lays out first the opponent's weak argument, and then now he presents, he ends, and concludes with the just position. 
So what we find here is that Paul overthrows the argument, simply makes you look at the argument for what it's worth. That's the argument of the flesh. The argument in Christ, the spiritual argument is, man is not independent woman is not independent of woman of man why did he have to say woman is not independent of man because when the women decide to take off their head coverings they're saying i'm no longer dependent on a male for my agency so that is why he starts by saying in the lord woman is not independent of man but he goes on to say to make the most radical part of that argument and that is that man is not independent of woman man is not independent of woman that is radical because in the ancient world man is independent of woman totally independent it is woman who is is dependent on man so that is the argument he takes a radical uh, um shift with the in christ hermeneutic what we notice too is that he applies a hermeneutic of suspicion because for example, when he talks about the man being the head, he uses the term head here. The term head may also be translated source, kephale. That, that word can also mean source. And it, it's like a play on the word because the assumption is your source becomes your head. So the old, uh, so the, uh, the, the second uh, creation account in Genesis assumes that man is the source of woman because God took him, took her from the, the 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 man so to speak as the story goes whereas in the uh the first account in genesis which by the way um the p account is is a later account than than the other account but there is that says that god created them male and female in god's own image so what 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 um what paul is saying there okay you say woman comes from man <laughs> all right but he says just as that occurred man comes through woman all right and we know that for sure that we know for sure <laughs> okay so so what is happening there is he says man comes through woman and everything comes from god so he goes back now and says god is the only source and here he goes back to the uh, first uh, creation account in genesis 1 that everything comes from god everything all things come from god that's the first creation account and that is the one he embraces the old one is 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 in that old we we'll say old all right um so let us now go to um uh the whole headship argument i think perhaps just a minute here um yes uh so Let's look now at the Ephesians and the Colossians text of headship. Let's go to those. And I think most of you know the text. If you're opening a scripture and read it, Ephesians 5, 21, 6, 9, if we, I put Colossians 3, 18 to 41 there because both texts seem to uh, say the same thing, but there is a radical difference between them. They seem to be the same. Colossians says, wives be subject to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands of your wife, never treat them harshly. Children obey your parents in everything, for it is acceptable to the Lord. Father, do not provoke your children, for they, they will lose a heart. And he says, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and so forth. Um, uh, whatever your task, put yourself into it. And then he goes on to say, master, treat yourself, your slaves justly and fairly, for you know that you have a master in heaven. Now, Ephesians 5.21 says, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Ephesians 5 verse 21 begins, whereas Colossians begins with the subjection of the wife, <laughs> Ephesians, uh, that's Colossians, Ephesians 5 begins by saying, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Again, we see the messianic call, the Christo call. And then it says, wives, be subject to your husbands, to the Lord, and, um, uh, and, uh, and 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 then it goes into uh, uh, what would I say as it, as it were kind of liturgy about um, uh, uh, just as Christ loved the church, um, uh, uh, just as Christ is subject, such as church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husband. Loves your wife just as Christ loved the church, gave Himself up for her in order that He may uh, purify her. Um, 
in, uh, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water and the word. And all that is not in Colossians. Um, so as to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind and so forth. And then he goes on to say, uh, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. All that is not in Colossians. Uh, all that, for this reason, a man should leave his wife and they become one flesh. This is a great mystery. All of that is added to what we have in Colossians. Then it goes to the children, parents, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right under your father and your mother. And, and so and fathers do not provoke your children to anger. And then it goes into the whole question of the slave as well. I think it was too much and they didn't hold there, right? And, and then it goes, if you can just, if you can just look at your, your own text um, um, quickly, uh, uh, Galatians 5, and then it goes on with the slaves where it says, slaves obey your early matters, your masters out of fear and trembling, singleness of heart. It's um, basically as the Colossians text. So let us look at these a little more closely, comparing Ephesians to Colossians text. The basic context of Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, verse 9 appears in Colossians 3, 18 to 41. But as we see there, the whole, um, as it were, liturgy about, you know, the love for the wife as Christ loved the church and so forth. Now, internal evidence suggests that both Ephesians and Colossians were written at the same time and delivered by the same person, okay? Uh, it, it was a tiki cost. And um, both letters also seem to have gone to the same area, Ephesus and Colossia being neighboring cities. Both of these texts appear as subtle subversion of the social hierarchy of ancient Rome. And I will look at that later. The Ephesian text, however, is explicitly, explicitly egalitarian, while the Colossians text simply mitigates the abuse that inevitably arises from any culture of domination. Ephesians seems to develop the mitigating attempt of the Colossians text. So let's look at again a little closer. Now, what we have in Ephesians and Colossians are what we call household codes of Rome. So the author of Colossians and Ephesians, they didn't come up with that idea. These were codes that were already in Rome and the codes uh, 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 advocated, uh, or Aristotle is said to be the author of the code. And there's another philosopher who's an author as well, that is name. But it's based on Aristotle's advocacy for the natural order of the father's rule over wives, children, and slave. What was happening there he says, the wife must submit to the husband and the children to the fathers and the slave to the master, who was, of course, the, the husband, the father. All these other stuff you see there in Colossians and Ephesians, not in the original also code. These are uh, attempts to mitigate the abuse that is inherent in the code. So whereas the code says, wives, be subject to your husbands, the Ephesian text says, be subject to one another. And it also says, husband, love your wives. All those things are not in the code. These are the, uh, the as it were, uh, the, the, the uh, attempt to allow the gospel to mitigate the kind of uh, uh, abuse and domination in the code. That's what's happening there. So what they do is they take the raw code and what they try to do is kind of subvert it, okay. Father should not just rule over their wives, they should love their wives. And Ephesians go even further to say, fathers must be subject to their wives, subject to one another. And also just do not abuse, uh, uh, children must obey their fathers, but fathers must not abuse their children. And in, even the slave part is radical, where it says slaves must respect their martyrs, masters um, uh, out of fear and trembling, and, and so forth. And then it says, masters do the same. That is radical. All those things is not the code because the Roman household code is about having the father's rule. It's about male domination, ex uh, 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 basically. So this is how the application of the codes in Rome. In Roman society, the code is written to uphold the rights of the powerful and to keep the less powerful in their place. The power differential between husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves were thought to be necessary in ancient Rome for social stability. That was why they had the code. 
but in the church, they sought to mitigate and minimize any harsh treatment by the people with greater power in Greek or Roman household, husbands, parents, male, female, slave owners, and so forth, um, towards people with less power. So the church sought to mitigate the code by adding all those things, Ephesians even, so we see. Now, how do, do the texts navigate the minefield of Roman social order? Now, Roman social order was a strictly upheld order. One could face death by violating the order or community could face death by violating the orders of Rome. So what the text is actually subtly disruptive, but of necessity, it falls short of a social revolution. So it's subtly disruptive. It is saying submit to one another. It's saying masters respect your slaves the way you want them to respect you. It says fathers do not provoke your children. And why? Does it fall short of a social revolution? Two reasons. It could spell disaster for the Jesus followers, considering the suspicion under which they were already viewed in the Roman Empire as disturbers of the peace because, their radical message, because of their radical message of liberation. Paul's frequent imprisonment and beatings gives us a glimpse into the risk that we're talking about here. The ethic of the Jesus movement, second, the ethic of the Jesus movement was an eschatological ethic. What do you mean by that? They were operating in light of an imminent parousia. Parousia is a big word we use for the return of Jesus in glory. As such, the aim was to privately live the egalitarian life of the spirit in order to transition smoothly into the new age of justice. Same word we call righteousness, the new age of justice. So what we see, let's look a little closer at the social subversion in Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, verse 9. The text subverts the code at the onset, be subject to one another in reverence of Messiah. This sets the stage for a code by code rebuttal throughout the passage. Not only do wives submit, but also husbands. Not only do children honor parents, but parents, specifically the fathers, must also refrain from dishonoring children through provocation. Not only do slaves obey and respect their masters, but masters must do the same to them. Radical subversion of the code. Now let us look at the husband and see how radical this subversion is. Husband as head of Christ. The reference to Christ as head in relation to husband as head is not an affirmation of the headship ideology. It is rather a mitigation and subversion of headship ideology. So what the text is saying to be head, the husband must submit, give himself as Christ gave himself. And this is a subtle way of neutralize, neutral, neutral, <laughs> neutralizing the code of male headship without creating social upstir. They were being smart here. So the passage recognizes the Roman household codes. At the same time, it applies the in Christ's hermeneutic of liberation in order to shift the code from its vertical axis of domination and the inevitable abuse to an horizontal axis, a horizontal axis of mutuality and love. Be subject to one another in reverence. Phobos of Messiah. The absence of the definite act of Phobos and before, before Phobos and before Christu, Christ, um, uh, indicates not the historical personality of Jesus of Nazareth as explained above, but spirituality of Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah Jesus, the faithful and just. So in, it, it is a way of walking by spirit over against walking by flesh, works of law, whether it be Judaic or Roman and whereby the community finds liberation and justice in an imperial culture defined by unfreedom and injustice. And of course, this in Christ's understanding sets the stage for rewriting the code. Husband, love your wives as your own body. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Master, treat the slave in the same way they are to treat you. All right, so then. Let's look a little closer what's happening with, with this other gospel. We say headship theology is the other gospel. That's what it is. It's the other gospel. 
The difficulty that arises today regarding gender equality as it emerges from Christian communities does not originate with the Apostle Paul. Those differences arise from communities of resistance to Pauline egalitarianism. Paul has been rejected by many as misogynistic, but he holds that he, sorry, he owes that reputation principally to his impersonators and interpolators and interpreters who reflect a church that is cutting back on the egalitarianism of the early days. Two major cases in point surrounding Romans 16 and the text of 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15 and its reflection in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, will, um, I will look at here quickly. Let's look at how um, the case of Genea um, re uh, reflects the resistance to Pauline egalitarianism. Now we see a radical egalitarianism in Romans 16 where Paul greets a long list of significant colleagues in ministry at the end of his letter to the Romans. This includes prominent women, not mere armor bearers. <laughs> the, the two most famous among these are Prisca, Priscilla, and Genea, both belonging to a husband and wife team. Significantly, Pisca's name precedes that of her husband, Achilla, which suggests that she was the prominent one here. But there are other Roman um, cultural ideas um, that, 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 that bring. Now, Janea, the case of Janea is very, very interesting. Janea, described by Paul as prominent among the apostles, is significant, uh, 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 is a significant state case study of how patriarchal assumptions may disfigure a text by denying its egalitarianism. She's a prominent apostle. She was in Christ before Paul. And along with her husband, Angelica, she was in prison with Paul. Now, for a millennium into Christian history, the Greek name Eunian, the accusative feminine of Eunia, which we translate Genia, was naturally and accurately assumed to be female and to be an apostle. Prominent native Greek speaking theologians such as Origen, Chrysostom, Jerome, third, fourth and fifth centuries, they were of the third, fourth and fifth centuries. They had no reason to read the Greek text of Romans 16 differently. Even 10th and 11th century theologians also um, had no doubt that Ionian was female. The Latin Vulgate, the old Latin among other ancient New Testament manuscripts all translate Ionian as Genea. And Chrysostom's commentary on the text states, indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. But by around the ninth century, the idea of a woman apostle stood as an offense to a Christendom now thoroughly entrenched in patriarchal domination, and thus began the attempt to erase Genea from the record. A simple change of the accent renders the name male originally accented New Testament text and the original uh, writings were not accented. Later they were accented, but the originally accented New Testament manuscripts unanimously render Hionian as a female name. Erasmus's 1516 critical Greek New Testament accented the name as feminine and this continued uh, and this continues in every critical Greek text until 1928 when the Novum Testamentum Greece uh, 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 Greek, uh, as accented it as male, with no manuscript evidence for the change. This shifted the tra trajectory towards masculine accentuation until 1998, when the feminine form came back to domination. And so the attempt to transform Ionia into Ionias uh, prove philolog philologically impossible. And time is going and I want to run through this. Can I skip this? Uh, but the point is here, they tried to change the name to a male name. And when they couldn't do that anymore, they tried to, to, to change the idea of prominent among the apostles to make it uh, well known to the apostles. Uh, but that wasn't possible either. Greek syntax could not allow that, but the ESV still has that rendering. All right, so we see resistance to the egalitarianism. Now, First Timothy and, sec uh, and Second uh, and First Corinthians fourteen thirty four are also two important um, cases as well that we need to look at. Now, in First Corinthians, now First Timothy two eleven fifteen. It, we know that text very well. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She's to keep silent. 
for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not this Eve, but the woman was the thief and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. And 1 Corinthians 14.34 sounds much like it. Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for the church to speak in the woman to speak in church. Now, let us look at women in Timothy. In Timothy, they are silent. Um, let us look at women, sorry, in First Timothy versus women in First Corinthians. What do we see about women in First Corinthians? In First Timothy, they are to be silent. In First Corinthians, they pray and prophesy. In First Timothy, it denies the, the, the legitimacy. It, 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 it denies the legitimacy of celibacy, especially for women. We see that in First Timothy. In First Corinthians, it says women as well as men are encouraged to remain single so that they can devote to the gospel. Vast difference there. In 1 Corinthians, women have mutual authority over men's bodies. <laughs> it, that's radical. In 1 Corinthians 7, they sanctify their unbelieving husbands, just as the, uh, the, the husband sanctifies his unbelieving wife. So we see this egalitarianism, radical egalitarianism in 1 Corinthians, where women are full moral agents. So what is going on in 1 Corinthians 14.34? We're going to get to that. But let us look at First Timothy. It's a proto-orthodox text. Proto-orthodoxy is really a precursor to Christian orthodoxy. It represents the incipient infiltration of Roman imperial values into the church and the beginning of the death of the gospel. That is my, that's my, my interpretation of it. The second century church father Tertullian, like other proto-orthodox church fathers, opposed women having authority to teach men or to baptize. What we see is that First Timothy is reflecting this. Um, and I, I'll come back on that text. All right. Um, uh, oh, we, we, we sort of mixed up the... So it's important to underscore that in both First Corinthians 14 and First Timothy 2 text, women are already teaching or speaking. Hmm? So the grammatical construction indicates that the text is asking them to stop. This means that a practice is being discontinued, all right? So what is happening is that egalitarianism is being rolled back. Now, this is the thing with 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, to 35, there's a mistake there. It is, I'm, I'm rushing along, so follow me carefully. It is difficult to ignore the contextual discomfort of 1 Corinthians 14.34 within chapter 14, within the whole of 1 Corinthians text. And we see the discomfort showing up in early mainly Western texts that place verses 34 to 35 after verse 40 at the end of the chapter. Many of the texts decided to put it at the end of the chapter. Now there's a Latin uh, codex, you know, where you have these manuscripts where um, it seems to me that the editor, uh, it, what he does, uh, um, it, it, it has all, uh, all, uh, all verses 34 to 35. The entire chapter 14 appears with verses 34 to 35. However, after verse 33, there's a scribal signum that is a sort of mark pointing that directs the reader to a note in the lower margins of the page. And the note has the entirety of verses 36 to 40, but it omits verses 34 and 35. And, and Metzger says, he asked the question whether the editor is saying that this must be omitted when reading the lesson. So this may be an indication by the scribe to omit it, maybe an indication that the text was interpolated, all right? That it was added later on, all right. Now, back to 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, the hierarchical structure of authority that immediately follows the rebuke of female authority with this hierarchy of bishop, elder, deacon seems alien to the generation of Paul and the apostles, all right? 
as a New Testament theologian, uh, Pamela Eisenbaum, who argues that this structure of authority seems to match the context of Christian communities that existed 50 plus years after Paul's time. And she then points to its location in the early Christianity in the writings of the sec second century proto-Orthodox church leader, Ignatius of Antioch. And there are other reasons too, um, that the oldest manuscripts of Paul's letters um, do not have first and second Timothy and Titus. Does not, they do not have, the, that, that, those do not have the pastoral epistles. Um, so the question is, is the letter um, to Timothy an appropriation of Paul's voice in a patriarchal counter-revolution? That's the question. Are these reflecting that? All right. Um, uh, so what we see there is an attempt to roll back the egalitarianism of Paul. So let me end with this summary. Um, the entire framework of Paul's theology, his Christology, his soteriology, is set up against any form of domination. Gender is one issue in the age-long human quest for domination defined as patriarchy. Obsession with ethnic, religious class, and gender identity Paul describes as work, works of flesh. So as works of flesh is the foundation of human bondage. This obsession was medicated in the early church by the urgent call to be in Christ. The essential liberation of the gospel is liberation from ego, flesh, same as flesh, same as historical identity. In Christ is a spiritual vocation that reunites humanity with God and with each other. Romans 16 and elsewhere demonstrates egalitarian collaboration among slaves and Gentiles and female apostles and teachers, such as Jonea and Prisca. The so-called patriarchal Pauline texts are patriarchal not from Paul's voice, but from the voice of interpreters and possibly impersonators and interpolators. Major texts such as 1 Corinthians 11, 3 to 12, Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, verse 9, interpreted to support male headship ideology, are in actuality subversive texts that oppose male headship and concomitant hegemonic power relations of the Greco Roman Empire. Explicitly, misogynic, misogynic, misogynistic texts such as 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, and 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, do not comport with Paul's teaching and ministry, and thus cannot be the standard bearers of the early church practice. These should not be allowed to cast a shadow on the brilliant, courageous, countercultural egalitarianism of Paul and the early church. Headship ideology belongs to an old dispensation of sin. And we come back to the text. I'm astonished that so quickly you've turned away from the gospel to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel. The new dispensation is not really new, but the original one to which we must seek restoration. God gave them, male and female, dominion over the earth, not over each other. I will end my rant and allow you all to respond. All right. Thank you.